So this session, animals in the public arena, uh, and the first speaker is Kim Stallwood, who um, has been around a long time. He's actually, um, I followed him in my first job in animal welfare at Compassionate World Farm, and Kim went before me. I think he became vegetarian after working in a chicken factory, that's right, isn't it, Kim? Maybe. And uh, he, 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 he um, worked for Compassion, then was very much involved with BUAB at the height of the rising animal rights movement in the 1980s. Then went to America, worked for Peter, uh, Animal for Gender, um, where he was editor. He's done a lot of writing, he's done a lot of campaigning, he's done a lot of experience. Uh, and he's going to be our first speaker today. So, welcome, please, Kim Storwood. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. If I speak at this level, can you all hear me okay at the back? Yes. Thank you. Um, also, I want to say that I'm just getting over a really bad cold, so if I suddenly start going into an apoplectic fit with a coughing attack, I do have water, I have polos, I'll calm myself and I'll carry on. I want to thank very much the organisers of the conference, um, Jess, Nikki, Louise, Nathan, and Daniel, and anyone else who's been involved. It's uh, a great event, and congratulations. Very honored to be invited to, to be here today to speak after Richard, who is a, a great colleague and friend and someone who I admire tremendously, and Mark, who uh, we've sat through many campaigns together, working uh, collaboratively, and a great deal of respect for him as well. And uh, it was a great pleasure to meet Lee this morning, and I look forward to your presentation. I'll uh, let people get comfortable, and uh, this won't be minutes of my time, Mark, as this happens. <laughs> The question I seek to answer is this, is animal rights a moral crusade or a political movement? I will conclude that it is both. However, the animal rights movement currently sees itself more of a moral crusade than a political movement. I will make the case that this impedes our ability to achieve moral and legal rights for animals. The animal rights movement must understand itself as a social movement and be engaged with mainstream political arena. For the purposes of this talk, I use animal rights to mean a broad range of organizations with varying ideological perspectives and differing tactics and strategies. I work from the assumption that what unites them is a genuine concern for animals and a commitment to end animal cruelty and exploitation. Everyone who I have met who advocates for animals, except for those who are raised by vegan or vegetarian parents, has a compelling personal story of how they change from being a meat eater to a vegetarian or vegan. My story began when I was a student in 1973. I worked in a chicken slaughterhouse. I didn't work on the slaughter part of production line was on the post slaughter part of production line. But I did work in the chicken slaughterhouse. And that led me to becoming a vegetarian in 1974 and then a vegan in 1976. Philosopher Tom Reagan describes in his book Empty Cages three types of animal advocates. They are the Damascan, who has a startling revelation, the muddler, who struggles with the challenge of animal rights throughout their life, and the da Vincian, who intuitively understood all along. <laughs> My colleague, I am not a da Vincian, let me just add very briefly, I see myself as a muddler very much. My colleague at the Animals and Society Institute, Ken Shapiro, he characterizes animal advocates as caring sleuths 
hearing sleuths discover, seek, and embrace the suffering of animals. These personality types help to illustrate who animal advocates are and how we each arrive from different places. Regardless of any differences, each personal narrative is unique. Everyone experiences a personal transformative moment when what was previously hidden from view and what we are trained not to see reveals itself for what it is, institutionalized animal exploitation. We see meat not as delicious steak, but as the charred remains of dead animal body parts. The personal transformative moment is powerful, so compelling that it overwhelmingly informs the rationale of most of the animal rights movement's current strategy to educate the public. This is why the animal rights calendar is full of media stunts, information dissemination, demonstrations, advertising campaigns, personal appeals by celebrities, and so on. These are all attempts to influence people to essentially go vegan. And not that there's anything wrong with that. As a moral crusade, these public education campaigns are primarily seen as the only tool available in the toolbox. Their importance, I think, becomes overstated. Consequently, they take on the vicarious urgency of animal rights as a quick fix or as a moral shock. Celebrities make animal rights sexy, put sexy in quotation marks. And living as a vegan is seen as a fashion <coughs> statement, which could just as easily go out of fashion. And this is how animal rights has become a moral crusade. I think not everyone will go vegan. And do we even have all the time needed to make progress one life at a time? So concurrently changing ourselves and inspiring others, we must also change society. Any change in society is accomplished in a surprisingly small number of ways. Politics, education, culture, competition, cooperation, and unfortunately, war. Fortunately for most of us, we live in a democracy, however flawed that democratic process may be. One of the most important ways we compel people to behave is with public policy. In other words, regulations and legislation. These, the assemblies, congresses, and parliaments that we elect by the, the people elect, they pass laws. Some of us may not need laws to compel us in, in, in ways to act in the interests of animals. We voluntarily do it. But many, if not most, will need to feel the impact of pro-animal public policy to make them live in ways which do not harm animals, even if they're not interested in doing so. The animal rights movement fails to transform its moral crusaders into political activists. Presenting simultaneously the need for personal transformation with social and political objectives, this explains why vegan living is not only lifestyle choice, but also, I believe, is an enduring political mm -hmm. statement. I see being vegan as an enduring political statement. There is a need for an animal rights movement which simultaneously functions as a moral crusade and as a political movement. I'm making the case that we primarily function as the former and we don't really understand ourselves as the latter. The animal rights movement is a social movement. There are many similarities among social movements. By social movements, I mean a progressive social movement, a movement within society for change. So there are many similarities among social movements, including the animal rights movement with the Green Movement and Women's Movement, uh, Child Advocacy Movement, and others. But there are two significant differences which makes the animal rights movement truly unique. 
First, animals cannot organize their own social movement. Unlike humans, animals cannot be the agency of their own liberation. We have to do it for them on their behalf. This onerous responsibility makes it even more important for us to understand how to achieve animal rights if they are relying upon us to liberate them. Second, we have to tackle the complex issues of the benefits accrued from animal exploitation. I'm not justifying them when I say this, but we have to recognize the complex issues of the benefits that are accrued from animal exploitation. I tend to think these benefits are overstated by the animal industrial complex. Uh, by animal industrial complex, I mean the industry that in its many ways uh, uses and abuses animals and profits financially and otherwise from their exploitation. <clears throat> when the public think about their relations with animals, they are reluctant generally to give up any pleasure, eating meat, for example, or benefit, curing disease, that they may feel that there is entitlement. Humans feel entitled to be able to use animals for their benefit. But as Barbara Noski, who coins the phrase animal industrial complex, as Barbara Noski writes, which human needs are being fulfilled and whose interests are promoted by the existing animal industrial complex? In other words, are all the products and services derived from animal exploitation, as well as all the other ways we use animals, truly essential for our survival? And I just don't think that's the case. They're not. Whatever may or may not be at risk, the benefits we do accrue from not relying upon animals to produce food and manage disease are considerable. <coughs> History shows that social movements are accused routinely of seeking change which will adversely affect society if they achieve their objective. This, the joke that you hear, you know, vegans are out to change the world as we know it. There's always that phrase, as we know it, that's hung on the end. But rarely is it ever true that social movements, when they achieve their changes, have negative outcomes. Indeed, it's any wonder that we've made the social and economic progress that we have, given those outrageous claims of the past, and the present, you know, vegans and rice, we get accused that if we can't use animals to produce food, we're all going to starve. <laughs> you know, we're all going to die of disease if we can't use animals in research. We won't know how to entertain ourselves if we can't see animals in zoos or circuses or marine parks, and so on. It's nonsense. Those who maintain we must use animals to produce food and fight disease will say, any rights animals may have must be subordinate to dominant human interests. This frames human and animal interests as a competition, a strategic dichotomy or too prevalent in human history. Men superior to women, whites to blacks, natives to immigrants, heterosexuals to homosexuals, and so on. In our case, it is humans are superior to animals, which, thank you Richard, is called speciesism. As society evolves and we do become aware of our superiority prejudices, we do seek to resolve them in the, fa in the famous phrase of in the fullness of time. As we become more aware of the resulting injustices, as we do become aware of injustices, we do try to remedy them. I do have that much faith in humanity. I don't have a lot of faith in humanity, but I do have some faith in humanity that we will be able to, we do have a history of readjusting injustices. We readjust, accommodate, and move on, in all likelihood, all the better for it. The same I have no doubt will be true for animal rights, particularly when we understand that if we want to feed the world's population, and encourage well-being, animal exploitation in factory farms and research laboratories are not only fundamentally problematic, 
but also significant contributing factors to aiding famine and disease. This is why it is vital animal rights is understood as part of a progressive agenda of social justice alongside other liberation movements. The animal rights movement must learn, including from other social movements, how social justice is accomplished. By that I mean to address the issue of animals in the political arena. Animals are in the political arena. It's their representatives that we should be concerned about. Now when I say that, I'm not looking at Richard in this regard. I'm talking about the representatives from the animal industrial complex. These powerful commercial interests that profit from animal exploitation are well-established political players. Their involvement in the political process helps to maintain the status quo, to adopt regulations and pass laws that help animal users more than the animals themselves. This political bias in favour of animal exploitation is reinforced by our continued institutionalised commercial use of animals as property and disposable commodities. There is a lot of money to be made from animal exploitation and many other non-financial gains. It is therefore not surprising that most of the present regulations and laws <coughs> relating to animals is more about protecting our interests in what we do to them than in us defending them from our actions. <coughs> animals are represented in public policy by those who benefit from the power and control they exert over them. Animal researchers, not anti sectionists, and factory farmers, not vegans, are more likely to be members of the policy-making networks which determine regulations and laws governing our relations with animals. Consequently, animal-related public policy is more about how to use animals than protecting them from us. Now, I hope, please all hope with me, I can make this work. So, in thinking about social movements, um, from my research of them, I've come to the conclusion that they essentially pass through five stages. The first is public education, when people are enlightened about the issue and embrace it into their lives. The second is about public policy development. This is when political parties, businesses, schools, professional associations, and the other entities which constitute society adopt sympathetic positions on, on, and on, any, on the issue in hand. The third stage is that this leads to legislation when laws are passed on the issue, and then litigation when laws are implemented and enforced on the issue. Public acceptance is the fifth stage, when the issue is embraced by the majority of society. Now this is simplistic, it's problematic, but it is helpful, at least I think it's helpful, it's helpful for me I should say, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you. This is the lifespan of a successful social movement as it emerges from obscurity to acceptance. It is possible to determine which stage is reached and what is next, and why some organisations and issues fail, stagnate, or succeed. We can discover the lifespan of a successful social movement and anticipate what happens next. A couple of minutes, Kim. Sorry. Okay. Nearly there. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to show in this slide is that The moral crusade of a personal lifestyle choice and the political movement for institutional societal change are very different approaches in a complex long-term process, and Richard very much spoke about that uh, this morning. Most issues start in stage one and expand to the others, but not always in a clear sequential order. Life is very complicated. Everything never fits neatly into any analysis. Simplistic schemes such as this are problematic. Nevertheless, they help to determine 
where we have come from and where do we go from here. The key point I want to make next is that for any social movement to achieve its mission, it must pass through each of the five stages and maintain an active engagement in each one. So as, we, as animal rights emerges from one stage, it needs to maintain that level of activity in order for it to move on to the next stage and then maintain that level of activity. As we pass through these five stages, the ability to resist set, setbacks, obstacles and opposition from opponents is diminished more and more. In other words, as a social movement expands its presence in each stage while maintaining activities in each one, the power of control that any opposition may wield against it is increasingly weakened. So for example, as we pass through each of the five stages, our ability to resist what our opponents want to do, we get stronger in that regard. The five stages are personified in the transition animal advocates must take from moral crusader to physical activist. We can never assume a growing collective of personal lifestyle change automatically leads to institutional societal change. The capriciousness of human nature is subject to change. Institutionalized regulations and laws are much more entrenched expressions of society's values. They're more difficult to change once they're there. Presently, I conclude the animal rights movement is mostly in stage one, public education, with some presence in stage two, public policy, three, legislation, four, litigation. If stages one and two are the moral crusade, stages three and four are the political <coughs> movement. In contrast, the animal industrial complex is resolutely entrenched and fully engaged in all five stages. To conclude, the animal rights movement's present strategy reveals our political naivety. Actions frequently occur in isolation and absent any long-term strategic, organized political vision or mission. And in doing so, I do not criticize my esteemed colleague Richard and others. I criticize myself, if anything. The animal rights movement does not make a, has not got a coherent, long-term, macro strategy to achieving institutional change. Surely the mission of the Animal Rights Movement is to encourage individual change and work for institutional societal change. Animal rights is more than just a moral crusade, it is a political movement too. Thank you. I should have said at the beginning, I think what I'll do is take a couple of questions directly to Kim and then a couple of questions directly to Lee at the end and hopefully we'll have time for a bit of general discussion as well. So anybody want to put a question to Kim? Yes. Sorry, um, you said at one point how there are some people who say something like, if we can't exploit animals then we starve. And I suppose I might be inclined to agree that if, I mean always depending on what you mean by exploit, perhaps we were to replace exploit with something like if we can't feel free to cause certain animals to suffer, then we'll starve. Would that be something that you'd feel happy accepting? Um, uh, I'm not sure that I would. Uh, I think <coughs> perhaps the way to respond is, is just to clarify what I was trying to convey in that remark. Um, I think that uh, farming and agribusiness makes the case that we have to use animals to produce food. The argument I'm making is that I don't agree with that point of view. I think that we can feed people without, uh, on a, on a, on a, uh, without using animals. People, I think that we can grow enough food to feed people so they can exist on a vegan diet. Right, so I, I, I suppose what I was meaning rather is that in order to produce vegetable matter that human beings can eat, you're going to have to cause certain animals to suffer. Oh, I understand the point that as a vegan that does not automatically mean that you are completely exempt from causing suffering somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. Because yes, if you, um, however, however hard we may try, inevitably at some point we are directly or indirectly involved <coughs> in causing animal suffering. And um, 
my position on this is the uh, it's a bit of a cliche to say this, but I think that being vegan is, is a journey, not a destination. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you very much. I thought that was a brilliant assessment of how we got to where we are now. The thing that you didn't mention at all, which I think is adding another dimension of complexity, is globalization. Because what we're doing now in society, we actually have to have that long term strategy. It has to be a global strategy. And as Richard mentioned, you know, we need to be working for a United Nations Declaration. It's not an end in itself. But unless we're actually working in every country around the world, we are constantly undermined by, um, by other factors. So I just wonder how you factor that into, your, um, into that matrix. Um, um, Cindy, I appreciate your comment and I agree with you and I think that in, in uh, although 15 minutes is a generous amount of time, it doesn't really accommodate you know, some sort of analysis of capitalism and globalization and then exploitation of animals. And I look forward to going to the session later this afternoon or this morning that's going to address that. But I mean, absolutely agree with you. Um, and uh, animals are capital which are being used across, you know, transnationally. And um, we've got to think increasingly globally in, in challenging animal exploitation. And, and um, there are major organizations that do that, but in the day, in the age of the internet, you know, individually, we can also do that through, through the web. We've got time for one more, I don't know, to, uh, <laughs> just beat you to it, so yes. Um, you mentioned that being uh, vegan is a political statement. I would, um, uh, yes, I ended up in vegan society. I was wondering what you thought of um, the critical mass issue, because as animal rights activists or vegans, we're not quite critical mass required to make that political statement. Um, do we count, do <coughs> politics, do politicians actually um, recognize our statement as such? <coughs> what do you think should we do to make make more of a statement and reach that critical mass? Uh, I, I would repeat many of the issues that I sort of very you know summarily made just now. Um, uh, uh, and knowing you and your 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 own personal activities, I would would make the point that uh, regardless of one's political ideology, that I would advocate that. Uh, if you feel predisposed toward a political party, is to actually join that political party and get involved within it to advance the animal issue. Um, and there are various sort of caveats around how to actually do that. But I think working from within the political mach mainstream machine will also help advance the issue. Um, I think the critical mass thing is really interesting, and um, I uh, sort of recognise that it actually happens. My reading of what I read about it, sometimes I think it's, it's it, it, I'm not convinced that political mass actually happens, and then other times I think, well, yes, there is a, there is a political mass. One, one br briefly, one interesting aspect is the critical mass of how culturally things get shifted so quickly through um, the entertainment industry, you know, how, how an artist, for example, overnight becomes internationally recognized. Now, how does that happen? And I think that we need to sort of, you know, look at that a bit more and understand how that works. Jasmine, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I've tried. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. And our second speaker today is Lee McConnell, and it's the first student to graduate student have a go today. And I know it's not supposed to say in academic circles, but I know he's nervous because he's not used to this a number of people. Um, he's a full-time doctoral research student at Northumbria University, which I've learned is in Newcastle. Uh, his expertise are in um, human rights, the law as it pertains to human rights. Um, but he has some academic interest and a certain personal interest in um, the animal issues, legal animal issues. So we really welcome Lee McConnell. Thanks very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak alongside Kim. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, so today I'm going to try and talk about um, animals as probably the adequacy of current legal protection. I'm going to talk about what the current legislation means for animals, uh, farm animals specifically. 
Um, so I'm going to say, are these prima facie advancements in legal protections effective? Um, is this a useful focal point for animal advocates generally? And I'll be trying to draw illustration from domestic and world legal systems to highlight um, issues and limitations across those legal systems, such as potentially harm to animals justified on customary or economic grounds or on the basis of other human benefits. Um, I've provided a timeline, hopefully most of you can see that, it's not a huge problem if you can't. Um, but that's kind of a diagrammatic representation of the legal development over the past 200 years. Um, and in that time, the prevailing method of legal protection, not currently enforceable legislation, is rooted in welfare, where animals are protected by virtue of their status as property rather than through the description of actual legal rights. Um, and to contextualize this a little bit, um, obviously there's been a moral shift uh, through time from the departure from Cartesian notions of animals as machines, um, which has in many ways paved the way for legal positivists such as Jeremy Bentham, who recognize the concept of just animalium, or the natural inalienable rights of uh, animals, notably distinct from legal rights, but nevertheless a, a shift in moral consideration. And indeed it's Bentham's famed articulation of the concept of unnecessary suffering, uh, which remains to some extent embodied in the currently enforceable Animal Welfare Act 2006. When Bentham, uh, Bentham said the question is not can they reason, not can they talk, can they suffer? So speaking of welfare as a means of protection generally, it's only really been since intensive farming practices have been adopted and become more commonplace that really any legislative regulation has occurred in that area. Um, Peter Sankoff in his book, The Welfare Paradigm, notes that, quote, despite the apparent entrenchment of welfare protections in contemporary laws governing animals, welfare was not as much a concern since animals were generally part of the labor and transport on farms and not raised solely as food. As a general proposition, it remains accurate to suggest that people have little incentive to harm their own property. So we can look at the first major prosecutions uh, which arose on the basis of destruction of an animal, um, based, basically destruction of another person's property rather than any specific legal rights enjoyed by animals. So I've used the 1793 case of John Cornish who was found not guilty of maliciously maiming a horse by ripping out its tongue um, because the judge ruled that he could have only been found guilty if it was shown that the wounding occurred because of malice shown towards the owner. So clearly no uh, concern for animals' interests to demonstrate that. And if we leap further into the centre of the timeline, um, this is the Protection of Animals Act 1911, which was the first set of comprehensive legislation in respect of uh, animals, which have essentially provided the offence of unnecessary suffering in its cruelty provisions. And if we leap forward another 100 years, we can see the Animal Welfare Act 2006, the currently enforceable uh, legislation, the substantive provisions of which feature on the reverse of the timeline. Uh, and I'll try and look at one or two, if we have time, of these in a little bit more detail to demonstrate some of the issues that we have. So if we start with the Section 4 Offence of Cruelty, uh, this provides that there must be an act or omission which causes the animal to suffer by a person who knew or reasonably should have known that the act or omission would have that effect and was likely to do so. So actual suffering is crucial in this context. Uh, the destruction of an animal um, in an appropriate or humane manner is excluded under the Act. So in the case of Isted versus the CPS, the Law Justice Brook demonstrated this in relation to shooting and injuring a neighbor's dog. Um, and they said that <coughs> it could not have been convicted of the offense if the dog had been killed outright in circumstances where she did not suffer unnecessarily. So destruction in and, in and of itself is not necessarily cruel in this Act. Um, and indeed, the concept further developed in uh, the consecutively decided cases of Hall and Isaacs, where the divisional court determined that the offence of cruelty was only committed where suffering of an animal was unnecessary in the sense of it being uh, of it not being inevitable despite proper husbandry. So this raises some questions about loopholes in the act and what what are these proper husbandry standards and what is <coughs> unnecessary suffering? What is the criteria in which we determine that? Um, and generally it seems that where husbandry practices are commonly recognized and not prohibited by the legislation, suffering will not be deemed uh, unnecessary. So in the case of Roberts and Ruggiero, uh, the magistrates adopted a test to determine uh, what unnecessary suffering was, and they said that it was beyond that which was expect suffering beyond that which was expected in the particular type of animal husbandry rather than an animal husbandry in general. So um, this was so, so suffering was beyond that which was expected, for example, in intensively farmed poultry rather than also taking into consideration free range or alternative methods. So this is a tendency to favor traditional approaches or established uh, farming practices um, and avoidance of alternative methods, and it doesn't seek to establish a general threshold of suffering across 
various different aspects of animal that's been reasonable. Um, for the entirely different case and far older case of Ford and widely applied different standards, um, this case involved the pain for removal of uh, horns from cattle. Um, the criteria centered on necessity and finding the legitimate aim in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the suffering that was, uh, that was carried out. Um, the pain inflicted needed to be proportionate to the object sought. So crucially, the method of alter alternative methods of husbandry was considered in this context. Um, but these ideas of customary or established farming practices and the balance between human and animal interests are <coughs> fundamental concerns. And indeed, this balancing is a, is a concern generally. And uh, Gary Francion, um, a prominent animal advocate, comments on this um, in great length. And he believes that the process is nothing more than an illusion in which the outcome has been predetermined in the light of the very different status of supposedly competing parties. Um, so it's, he believes that it's impossible to balance uh, the interests of animals while they exist as property and therefore means to human ends. So food producers can justify intensive practices on the basis of, on the, basis of the need for high volumes of cheap food, etc. So Francio very much believes that the welfare legislation fails completely to recognize that animals have any non-tradable interests. And I think this is illustrated um, quite well in respect of the Section 12 um, uh, part of the Act, which permits the uh, passage of additional regulations uh, for the promotion of, of welfare. Um, the case of the Crown versus uh, Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs involved uh, the practice of restrictive feeding on birds once they reached their goal weight before slaughter. Um, so this left the birds starving or arguably suffering from chronic hunger. Um, European directives guaranteed an appropriate diet for the agent species and to be fed at um, sufficient interval, intervals that are appropriate to their physiological needs. But uh, Justice Newman found that the requirement to take all reasonable steps was sufficiently implemented in consideration of welfare. But the regime of restrictive feeding was not in and of itself uh, contrary to law, and that the balance, a balance was required in respect of attendant or fundamental aspects of farming systems and animal welfare. So here the judiciary assumed that the legislation was not intended to limit the use of common agricultural practices, especially it seems where demonstrably there was a maximization of economic profitability or the human benefits. And as such, to an extent it can be argued that this lack of consideration of the methods themselves and uh, drawing a balance between alternative methods um, excludes to an extent intensive farming practices generally. To look at uh, some world legal systems, um, the progress in New Zealand is, was slow and in many ways analogous to um, in England uh, up until recently where the acts, the Animal Act 1999 is arguably more progressive since it recognises the limited uh, rights for great apes. Though Peter Sankoff criticises this on the basis that yeah, the progressive nature of the legislation is overstated in that it ignores the millions of animals utilized by the agriculture industry every year. And uh, Schultz argues that there is an irony in the primary motivation for legislative reform coming from the agricultural industry itself, uh, largely provoked uh, by economic concerns born out of the EU, which threatened to tighten trade and import uh, restrictions on uh, the outdated New Zealand legislation. And in, in illustration, I would suggest the case of uh, the Crown and Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. Um, this involved a petition to ban the export of veal calves, uh, which would be housed in veal crates outside of the UK. Um, Article 28 of the AC Treaty prohibits trade restrictions on goods, and this includes uh, agricultural goods such as animals. But it was argued that there should be an exception made to these prohibitions on trade restrictions on the basis of public morality, uh, policy, protection of health and the life of humans, animals, or plants under Article 30. But this ultimately failed due to regulation by a directive which had not uh, banned real crates in itself. And as such, it can be argued that genuine concerns about animal welfare had to give way to trade imperatives under the EU. Um, they have similar, uh, a uh, similar issue of regulations to Section 12 of the UK Act, uh, the English Act. Um, but Peter Stankoff again believes that, at the end of the day, despite public outcry, practices are legal and economic concerns prevail, and that the legislation simply finds ways to entrench and legitimize established practices. And this can be uh, 
demonstrate, I think, in respect to the USA, where there's very little regulation at the federal level, um, and livestock and poultry have been um, excluded from any federal legislation. Indeed, the Humane Slaughter Act and the 28 hour law both exclude poultry, which amount to 90% of the animals slaughtered in the USA. Um, at a state level, similar concerns about customary practices, uh, justification on established practices in most states. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the McLeibel trial. Um, this case involved the uh, publication of a pamphlet which criticized McDonald's farming practices. And this was a libel case with no direct legal consequence under the Animal Welfare Act. Um, but it enabled the court to determine the criteria for unnecessary suffering and the cruelty aspects of customary practices in a new light. So McDonald's sought to distinguish cruelty on the basis of uh, customary or economic concerns, but the judge, under expert guidance, chose to determine on the basis of the number of animals involved in the intensity and, du and duration of the suffering. Uh, the, uh, ultimately, numerous customary practices relating to poultry, especially, were found to be cruel within this definition, and there was, as, as such, compelling evidence to justify the distribution of the pamphlet by Morris and Steele. So, I think what I want to draw out here is the fact that in the McLeibel trial, under these standards adopted in tort law, which are not specifically designed to protect animals, customary practices were found to be cruel. Yet, under the animal welfare legislation that we have, uh, for example, the restrictive broiler chickens case, you can see that uh, concerns are excluded on the grounds of custom or economic concerns. And this is legislation designed specifically to protect uh, animals' welfare. Um, and indeed, Mr. Justice Bell criticized the customary approach in the USA by saying that, quote, um, this hand's decision as to what is cruel to the food industry completely motivated as it must be by economics. And indeed, there are uh, animal advocates who argue that any minimum standards achieved through these welfare measures ultimately fall short because uh, they reflect the concern to maximize the value of animal property and militate strongly against significant improvement of our treatment to animals. So, in concluding, I would say that this presentation today is very much a, a black and white exposition and a snapshot into the conflicting dialogues at play into, uh, in, in this, in this uh, subject of legislation and law. And that clearly justification on the grounds of custom and the uneven balance of human animal benefits present concerning loopholes in most of the uh, most progressive world legal systems. And I suppose the question ultimately boils down to to what extent should animals be protected by the law? And this is obviously a subjective concern and which will differ from person to person. But I suppose this asks important questions of those who purport to be animal advocates and the way that we should direct potentially uh, activism. So thank you. Does anybody have a question they'd like to direct the lead? Um, just think of any. Yes. Could, could you shout it out as well? Because I think you're at the back. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, you say that the, the law falls short and that it um, puts property over welfare. Mm -hmm. How would you like to see um, future legislation being developed to address that? Yeah, um, it's a difficult point. Um, Clearly, property underlines the fact that as long as animals exist as property, they're going to be a means to human ends to some extent. What is practical in terms of legislative reform and achieving, achieving goals? It depends very much on your position, I suppose. So if you want to see abolition of, of all of the utilization of all animals, then you know clearly you have different, different criteria that you want to achieve. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't really say beyond me to say that. I can't really provide answers. I'm ho hopefully I'm just trying to provide, um, just demonstrate that there's huge problems in the Bay Area in this area. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm Andrew Knight, I'm a uh, spokesperson for Animals Count, which is the political party for people and animals here in the UK. Um, I've got a question about what you said about New Zealand though. Um, right. I'm actually, uh, firstly I should just warn you, I'm from Australia, my colleague sitting next to me is from New Zealand. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's traditionally been a bit of a rivalry. Um, you, you mentioned that um, the New Zealanders had some uh, legislation that was, I think, I think a bit uh, less less developed than 
including oh, Europe. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the European Union was considering uh, sanctions or, yeah. or, or trade. Now, I, I kind of missed what you said there. I was just wondering, could, could you clarify whether Good that point. is the case or not? Because <laughs> what you say will determine whether she's right or wrong, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I was saying was, I think that um, economic concerns can play a restrictive and reformist role, and that was what I was trying to demonstrate there. So um, this author, Schultz, said that the primary motivation for legislative change came from the agriculture industry itself in New Zealand, and that it was largely provoked by economic factors. Um, but they're very upfront about that, though. On the MAF website, it says that's why. Right, yeah. yeah. Point they say it, it's to do with um, yeah. trade. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it's nothing to do with welfare. Yeah. So I just thought that was an interesting point, just these economic human interests. To, to be fair, they're one of the first countries in the world to ban great ape experimentation, weren't they? So yes. they, they do have another side. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Any more questions? Anybody at the back? Yes. Is there any way that you can use um, uh, reverse this slightly and attack it from a different point um, than a, a legal protection against animals and try and use the health as aspect, aspects that, that people are suffering from? like the explosion of obesity in young people. So that you turn it around and try and tackle it from a different angle, mm. you know? It's not, some, it's not an angle that I've considered, but yeah, I mean, it sounds quite interesting. I haven't explored that at all. Um, okay, last one, yes. Just wonder where you think that the, the law might move with, move with regard to ritual slaughter mm. in terms of customary practice. Um, mm. yeah. And they're not being, strictly speaking, any, an economic case. Right, yeah. It'd be interested to know where you think that we might move with it's, the results of that. It's difficult for me to say. I couldn't, I couldn't really say. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. We're, we're Thanks very much. <laughs>
that we could get more benefit and more successes if we were more upfront about making that association between animal exploitation and uh, the human alleged human benefits. Does that make sense? If I explain that, you're all looking very sort of mm. non <laughs> Sort of like the government. Hold on, excuse me. I, I just please just can't. I've been having questions. If you want to ask a question, put your hand up. The power. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to ask uh, both of the speakers um, the same question. What is the political arena? Because I think, or I conclude from my uh, observations in Germany, that the animal rights movement. Um, has a, 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 a narrow focus. Do you understand what I what I want to say? That is um, a focus on rights and a, an, uh, an identification of politic political uh, movement as a movement for rights and a identification of political movement with uh, um, appealing to the to the official democratic states. And I want to know what do you understand? Uh, of a uh, political arena, because um, I think um, we ha we have to uh, do some theory on some state theory to understand what the state is really about, and I think then we can answer why, for for example, why the economic interest uh, in the end surpasses the political uh, uh, interests. Yes, do you understand what I what I ask? I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure that I understand the, the specific point of your question. What comes to mind is that within, within what you're saying, there's a lot of different related strands of, of issues. Yeah. And um, the, you know, the rights issue within the legislative arena, for example, the sort of whole constitution of how society is formed and the values that it has and what is the state and what is the political arena. Um, so just uh, answer my first question. What is the political arena for you? That, that the political is? arena for me is uh, the mainstream political arena. So it's, it's, being in, it's being involved with political parties which get elected and form power, essentially. That's the blatant definition I would use for the political arena. Okay. Okay, um, let's see, I've got different people. Um, yes, Chris, do you want to? One of the issues about that is that the whole free trade thing, which was Lee mentioned, yeah. uh, gives governments, successive governments excuses not to do anything. I remember back in the 90s when we had the line export protests, the, the Conservative government at the time was saying, oh, we'd like to ban the trade, but uh, we can't because of free trade laws. Mm -hmm. And the Labour MPs were saying, oh yeah, get us in power and then, and then we'll ban it. Because Labour got in power, they did absolutely nothing about it. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's one of the areas where consecutive governments have um, hit behind to, to stop progress on our uh, world. Well, so, do you have a question here? Yes. Well, you can make some, yes. Yeah, um, well, uh, this, is, this is a question for Kim. Uh, he presented um, uh, a several steps approach and then uh, the person who's uh, in front of me, I don't know, uh, made a, a very good point, I think, regarding the internal, internationalization of, of animal exploitation. Um, but then the, the, the reply, uh, while acknowledging this problem, wasn't very satisfactory for me for this, because uh, it was somehow assuming that we should address the, the last step of the, pro of the process at an international level. So um, we should uh, try to engage in this political action internationally. Well, the problem is that if we want to act internationally, what happens in many countries in Africa and in Asia, they haven't gone through the first steps. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we, I mean, I know that this may sound a bit paternalistic, but I don't think uh, that it's so because uh, it's not out of concern for people in those countries, but for the animals. But what I'm saying is, shouldn't we in, who are in, in countries in which the, the movement has developed a bit thus far and has, uh, and, and, and has moved a bit uh, to the first step, try to focus on uh, spreading this to other countries. If you think, for instance, of China, which will be a, a first, sub which is actually now a superpower. Uh, well, you know, we are, we, 
I have the impression that we may be wasting our time trying to achieve minor uh, political changes now, while uh, uh, there uh, nothing in the in the in the in the first steps has been achieved thus far. Um, I didn't mean to convey the impression that I felt that globalization, globalization issues should only be addressed in the final stages. Okay. So um, if I gave that impression, that was a, a, a mistake I made, because I think that globalization needs to be treated throughout the five stages. It needs to be discussed amongst us as, as individuals, as citizens in society. It needs to be raised within the uh, entities that constitute society, which I talked about in stage two, public policy. So um, if I gave that impression, that wasn't my intention, because I think the globalization is, is ever present and has to be addressed uh, individually and collectively. Can, can I, show of hands, anybody wants to, I know Cindy wants to ask a question, because I'm very aware that we're getting a break. <coughs> I don't want to keep vegans from their cake, because it could turn nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I just actually wanted to ask the question, are there animals that are part of the human no, I don't think so. Okay, because I think... You might have directed. Um, mm. You see, I think in some respects, we, the UK has been overtaken by Europe as an animal welfare leader. Mm. And the, in Europe, the only region with a constitution where animals are, are classified as sentient beings, and maybe that helps us break through this mm. whole impasse that mm. we've got of animals being defined as property, <coughs> and then the judiciary enshrining what that means mm -hmm. in traditional yeah. uses. Mm -hmm. I mean, because there's so much research going on, and this is a real world for academia, mm -hmm. on what sentience is, what it mm -hmm. means, that to the extent that we get that word into legislation around the world mm -hmm. on an unsuspecting kind of political <coughs> system, mm -hmm. and then we say, and here are the implications, because here's some research coming out of Exeter University, Bristol, whatever, whatever, that shows this is what sentient means, this is what matters to these animals. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm really encouraged to see this attempt to bring together or further consolidate the activists with academia, because I actually think a lot of what happens now does require that fusion. Activists get sentience into the legislation and academia follow up to deliver the, the, the research that underpins what, what the implications are. For yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. I, haven't, I hadn't fully considered that in that level of detail, but yeah. No more questions? Great, finishing bang on time. Thank you all for your contribution and another thanks for being with